we start? Ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Today's speaker is uh, John Bacelli. That's fine with me. Uh, from um, Unix Center for Mathematical Philosophy. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. I hope you can all see the screen because it's a pretty, pretty small screen. Uh, so it's great to be here, a wonderful seminar series. And so I'm going to present this paper entitled Act State Dependent Small Hazard and State Dependent Utility. Now it's a paper in the decision theory under uncertainty, so I should start by uh, giving the sort of framework right away. So it's a savage style sort of framework. So what the uncertainty is about is the state of nature and the savage style bit comes from the fact that I'll take finitely many states of nature, which is not the case in the original setup, but for my purposes it's enough. So you have this set S, if it's working, of state of nature. You have a set of payoffs, I have different names in literature, but I'm going to use payoff today, which is X. And the set of options between which the decision maker is choosing is X to the power S, that is to say it's all the um, state distributions of payoff. So one option, one act in the savage terminology is a function attributing one payoff to each state of nature. Okay, this is what I call an act. And the primitive is a binary preference over this, this set F, and whenever I say preference, you should be able to say uh, choice as well. So binary preference is interpreted as, as, as binary choice. Now the sort of results you want, the name of the game in this sort of, of setting is to get results like this, uh, that you have all heard about it here. Results that take the following form. You have a bunch of conditions on the primitive, the savage axioms in the savage uh, framework. And under those conditions, you can prove that there exists an expected utility representation of the choice data. That is to say, you can show that there exists a probability function P from the set of states to the reals, zero, 1, and a utility function U from the set of payoffs to the reals, such that the expectation of the utility function with respect to this probability function represents uh, the choice of, of the decision maker. This function V here in equation 1. Now, this sort of representation theorem, of course, comes with a uniqueness claim, a uniqueness theorem, and the standard version, it'd be very much what I'm going to focus on today, so this is why I flag out the usual form of the uniqueness claim, is that utility function u is unique up to um, any positive, strictly positive affine transformation, and the uh, probability function p is absolutely unique. Okay, so this is the standard sort of results you would like to get, the, the name of the game. The, uh V is, and V is defined as a function of those things, right? Is yeah, v, v is defined as a function from F to R. It is, this is the expected utility um, function, okay? Now, the interpretation, um, yeah, please, please feel free to interrupt at any point, especially considering the size of the screen in case things <laughs> are not very clear uh, for this or other reasons. Now, the interpretation uh, we're interested in is that this sort of result would give a sort of uh, recipe, if you wish, to behaviorally identify the beliefs and the desires of the decision maker. So those sort of results give you a set of procedures and conditions under which you can behaviorally identify the beliefs and the desires of the decision maker that were underlying the choice data you got. Okay? So the probability P behaviorally identifies the underlying beliefs and the utility U behaviorally identifies the underlying desires. Okay? That's the sort of interpretation uh, we'll be focusing on today. Now, of course, you have more general result than this one, the basic expected utility result. But what I want to flag out for the purpose of this talk is that they will always come with this sort of uniqueness claim. So their existing claim will be very different. Typically, they'll say that the beliefs take another form, that one probability function over the state space. Maybe it's several probability function, maybe it's a more general form of measure or whatnot. But the important point for my purposes is that the sort of uniqueness claim the theorems will come with will always be like this, namely the utility function will be pinned down up to this sort of transformation, a strictly positive affine transformation. And the belief side, whatever form the beliefs take, will be purportedly pinned down absolutely uniquely. Okay? I'm sorry, I was yeah. thinking about something when you started. So sure. The input is the, pre is the preferences of the... Yeah, or choices, yeah, yeah. So you observe the choices, and the name of the game is to identify the underlying beliefs and desire that, according to some models, um, produce the choice data you observed. Okay? 
Now, this talk is really focused on this uniqueness aspect of those theorems, the expected utility one or the non-expected utility ones. And more specifically, at the end of the day, it's really focused on the belief side of this uniqueness claim. As I'm really interested in this uh, claim that they provide a way of pinning down the beliefs absolutely uniquely. This is what I'm going to be discussing today. Yeah, so I mean, here you could fit, um, uh, I mean, we'll come to this later, but if it helps now, so you could fit Shoke expected utility, you could fit the Maximin expected utility models of Gilbo and Schmeidler, all those guys. I mean, as soon as whatever your model, the model you have is not one that features one probability function of the state space, but something more complicated, it would suffice to qualify a non-EU. So I define non-EU really negatively, whatever is not this form one. So for instance, again, the simplest case, and I will come back to it later, this will be a, a toy example in the discussion. For instance, you have a family thereof, a family of probability function that represent collectively the beliefs of the decision maker. Then you need to come up with a decision rule, and you have various options here, but for instance, instead of having one probability function, you have a family of them. This would be non-expected utility, all right. Does this answer your question? Okay. Now, the very short story about the, the talk in the paper is the following, that there is some bad news in my background literature, and I'm bringing some good news, some moderate piece of good news. So the, what is the bad news? The bad news is the so-called problem of state-dependent utility that I'm going to discuss in full detail later on. I'm not going to go in detail at this introduction stage, but essentially it's a problem <coughs> that is connected to, uh, pertains to the admissible class of transformations under which the utility function is unique. The key problem, as we'll see, is that this class of transformation is larger, in fact, than the class of strictly positive affine transformation, as we'll see later on. So that's a problem that, huh, this starts, that starts on, uh, let me see if I can try to fix this. That's a problem on the utility uniqueness side, but as we'll see, the main implication at the end of the day will be on the identification of probability in the case of expected utility, or more generally on the belief side. Although it's a problem that, as the name indicates, is about um, the utility side of the representation, as we'll see, uh, the implication is that the behavioral identification of beliefs is very much in danger. So that's the, the background literature. There's bad news that there is this problem, the problem of state dependent utility. And again, whatever the details of it, we'll get to them later. The stakes is the behavioral identifiability of the beliefs, starting from choice data. And I will bring some good news. Namely, I will show to you that the problem is in some respects overestimated, in two respects. First, that it's a problem that's very sensitive to the model, decision model you're talking about, and in particular the, the model of beliefs. It's a problem that's much more specific to expected utility than people have thought hitherto, and that's less relevant or less uh, salient in the case of non-expected utility. So this will be the first piece of, of, of good news. It's less general than people have claimed hitherto in literature. And second, it's also a problem that's less costly to solve, and here I have in mind mythological terms. As we'll see later on, people have claimed that to solve this sort of problem, solving this problem meaning coming up with a way of identifying the beliefs despite this problem of state dependent utility, you need to change the rule of the game pretty significantly. Change the rules of the identification game I've been talking about. Now, and as I show to you, this is not necessary. You can stick to the methodology I've been uh, alluding to up to now. Okay, so there's a very short story. There's this bad news, state dependent utility, and I'm going to <coughs> show you that the extent of the bad news is a bit smaller than people have thought hitherto in, in some interesting respects. Okay? Right, so before starting, I should mention that um, although state dependent utility is one of my main research interests, uh, this particular way of spinning the issue is uh, freshly out of the oven, so this is very much work in, in progress. Okay, so the outline is pretty simple uh, despite the length of the title. What I want to get you to is this part four, which will bring the piece of good news um, I promised you. But for this first, I need to explain to you the, the problem, uh, what it's all about, what I call the bad news up to now, this problem of steady utility. 
And to be able to reach the good news about this problem, we'll first start with something that looks unconnected, but actually will be instrumental in reaching this good news, starting working on a conceptual distinction between act state dependence and moral hazard. So we'll do some preparatory groundwork on this thing that seems totally unconnected at first, and it will be very useful at the end of the day for reaching these two conclusions I, 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 I promised in the introduction. Okay, so let me start with this <coughs> Um, preparatory groundwork about act state dependence and moral hazard. So think of it really as a sort of, of puzzle. Assume that you have some choice data, okay, but that you cannot apply the sort of theorem, uh, the sort of expected utility theorem I referred to earlier, namely your choice data as such that you cannot define a unique probability function and a utility function such that the expected utility uh, function represent the trace data. So you look in your shelf of representation theorems and you find one however that applies to the trace data that is one in which the only difference with respect to this model is that instead of using act independent probability functions you use act dependent probability functions. So you find this in your representation theorem shelves and you realize that you can analyze your choice data with act dependent uh, probabilities. Okay? Now, the question I'm raising and I'm be considering in, in, this, in this part is very simple. How should you interpret this? You have act-dependent probability in the data. How should you understand this? What does this mean? Okay? And I want to convince you that there are two interpretations. One may be more salient in your mind than the other. They are equally admissible at this level of generality. What it means is that if I just tell you act-dependent probability, the two interpretations are um, equally good and you cannot adjudicate between them. Yeah? So you're... Uh you're, you're calling this F? Is that, is that the act? Is that yeah, F, yeah, so F is, right, this is the uh, F and G are the individual members of this big set F. Okay? So it's F. one of the functions. And what is that, and how am I supposed to understand? What, yeah, it's a function from... This so, yeah, I let me repeat, yeah. F is a function attributing one payoff to each state. So each F, G, and so on and so forth is a state distribution of payoff, if you want to think of it this way. Okay? And act dependent means the probability of the um, state given the act is different from the probability of state. Exactly. It means that the probability, this is why it's also called um, act state dependence, it, act state dependence is short for the probability of the state depends on the act under which the state is envisaged or something like that. Okay? So assume you have this in the data. And now you want to know how you should interpret this. What does it mean that it would be X state dependent? Okay. Two interpretations. The first one that may be the most salient in your mind, especially for the one the closest to philosophy, is a very substantial interpretation of this of act dependence, to the effect that act act dependence, the act dependence of probability, indicates the fact that the resolution of uncertainty is influenced somehow, directly or indirectly, by the, the act in question. Okay? That's a very natural interpretation. So, to, f to flesh this out, think of each act, forget about this funny terminological distinction between act and action, where you think about actions, natural actions, and things about each action causally, for instance, although you could make this more general, influencing the resolution of uncertainty. So, for instance, you could think about a student that's thinking about various ways to prepare for his exam or her exam, right? So, those would be the various courses of action open to him or her. <coughs> Now, the states of nature in this example could be simply the grades he could get, okay, quite simply. And then there would be those payoffs that could be maybe the payoff his parents would give him or her, depending on how good, how well he did on, on the exam, right? And with, when he's thinking before the exam about how to prepare, well, he's essentially, of course, he should take into account the fact that the probability of the various grades will depend on the particular course of action he will, he's going to take, namely, uh, how he's going to prepare for the exam. Right? If he does not, then he will not properly um, uh, face the practical situation he's, he's facing. Now, note, however, that although you can tap on those examples almost endlessly, this equation in equation 2, the utility function by contrast with the probability function does not depend on the act. So it means that you need to have no effort story, no variable efforts across the action. Or to be more specific, you can have variable effort, but they must not be associated with different utility levels for the decision maker. Uh, this, otherwise, this, this won't fit in this simple, simple model. 
Now, for various reasons, this is often uh, connected to moral hazard in economics, contract theory, um, insurance contracts in particular, but other contracts as well. Now, for those knowledgeable about economics, there's a bunch of these analogies. I mean, the most massive one being that moral hazard is a concept that belongs to the theory of strategic interaction. So there are two players with different objective functions and have different interests, for instance, in a contracting situation. So of course here, nothing like this is, is happening, right? There's no interaction by, 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 by assumption. Uh, it's individual decision theory. And there's other differences as well. Nevertheless, there's this core analogy, which I think justifies reasonably the fact to connect this interpretation of state dependence with more hazard, namely that uncertainty, there is some endogeneity issues in how uncertainty is resolved. Right? In the case of economics, uh, there would be this agent that can put more or less work, for instance, in a task is completing for the principal, and this you need to take into account in writing a proper contract that both would have an interest in, 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 in accepting and enforcing in the, in the optimal way. And so to this extent, I'll call from now on this sort of thick, substantial interpretation, moral hazard, to signal this idea that this is an interpretation according to which act state dependence or the act dependence of probability means that the resolution of uncertainty is influenced directly or indirectly by the acts uh, or action chosen. Okay? And I think that with or without the word, there is nowhere where the connection is made more substantially than in, in the sort of decision theory that's most popular in, in philosophy, deliberative branch of decision theory, or people are interested in causal decision theory, and so on and so forth. They very much equate act state dependence with this formal interpretation of it. And for the people who actually use the term moral hazard, you could find very easily, here I just put an example, it's a recent book by Richard Bradley, where people say moral hazard, act state dependence, this is one on the same thing. Okay? Now, of course, I appreciate that this is very preliminary to what they're interested in, in this literature. What they're interested in is how you should cash out, in general, this form of act state dependence, substantial act state dependence, whether you should cash it out in probabilistic terms, in terms of probabilistic dependence or independence, or if you need a kind of robust notion of causal dependence or independence to account for all the cases you're looking at. So, of course, I understand that. Nevertheless, both sides, although they disagree about this, the evidentialist, the causalist, and all the refinements thereof, they agree about the fact that um, uh, the act, act dependence of probability should be interpreted substantially. In this way, I refer to the concept of, of, of moral hazard. Okay? So that's the, th the, the thick interpretation, which I'll call the moral hazard interpretation of act state dependence from now on. But there's a much thinner interpretation with respect to the form of agency it's attributing to the decision maker. And in fact, here you could fit about any non expectativity model you would know, not any, but about any. So let's see how it goes with uh, a model we already alluded to earlier in answer to a question. Then maybe the most famous non expectativity model, uh, the maximum expectativity model of Gilbert and Schmeidler. So it's a model, very simply, where for some reason, and I emphasize this, that are purely epistemic, that has to do with how the decision maker processes the uncertainty he's facing. For some reason, the decision maker uncertainty is not represented by one probability function, but by, by a family of them. Okay? One, one probability function is not enough to describe how he sees uncertainty. Okay? This is for purely epistemic reason, it has nothing to do with the ag agency of the decision maker in the sense illustrated by, by, by more hazard. And then, so the decision maker has one utility function, the set of probability function, he has to come up with some decision rule for combining the two when he's evaluating an option. And the story of this model is that he's trying to maximize minimum expected utility, which means he takes an option, okay, F, he looks at the expected utility of F according to all the prior in his set of multiple priors, and the value he attributes to this act is the minimum expected utility over the set. Okay, so he's very cautious, he looks at the worst case scenario and expectation, and that's the value he attributes to each option. And then when he compares f and g, say, or f and f prime, well, he maximizes the minimum expected utility, hence the name of, of the model. Right? So, if you want to stick to the story of the student I mentioned earlier, uh, you can just think about the student now, the exam is taken, it's fully done, there's no influence whatsoever on the resolution of the certainty, but just he's offered to bet on the result of his exam, just still to be graded by ferocious teachers, 
and uh, he's very unsure about the grade he's going to get. The states of nature are the same, for the sake of example. For instance, maybe he's actually even unaware of the grading schemes and he's hesitating between various grading schemes that could actually be implemented. And let's stick with this for the sake of example. Each probability function in the set could be attached to one particular grading scheme that he grants possible. And then when he's evaluating the bets that may be offered to him by his parents, they would be very perverse decision makers. And he's uh, looking at all those bets and decides, well, I mean, it could very well be, it cannot be excluded, he would be deciding in this sort of sense, looking at the whole set of probabilities, attributing a minimum expected utility and trying to maximize this number. Uh, so yeah. There, um, am I not so this PF is a constant there, right? No, P I mean, so PF is not a constant. I mean, it would vary. Okay, what, what do you, it depends what you mean. Can you elaborate on your question? I'm, not, I, I'm just, this PF before, so you're plugging, so you, for example, in, the equa in equation two, yeah. this PF is a, is a Okay, so, so a model like this is a natural probability. So yeah. but in this one, I don't see where you're. It's here. You take the the probability you would attribute to one act. The act dependent probability you would be actually using in your decision is the one given by this formula, which means the one that minim the one to which the minimum expected utility is attributed. So the way I'm pressing. What I'm pressing right now is that this model, and as we'll see in one minute, many other models, can be seen just as particular takes telling you how you get this PF for each F. But, but can I, yeah? just, just to make sure I understand, yeah. so if, if this is the definition of PF, then in this it model, does yeah. not depend on, e, on, a, on a single SI, the value of PF. So for example, in the sum PF above... Not a number, though, yeah. But okay, so how do you like calculate PF on a value? Well, you, so PF, it's a probability function from a big set, okay? And your model tells you, you have this big bag of multipliers, okay? You have this, for now I'm talking about no decision, okay? You have this bag of multiple priors. And the model tells you to know which probability you'll attribute to each act, take the probability in the bag that generates the minimum expected utility, or, I mean, up to indifference. So, but it's strange to hear the word probability being used. Yeah. Probability distribution. I don't know if that's misleading uh, Demetrius, but it keeps yeah. confusing me. Okay. Okay. I mean, here I meant in this particular case probability distribution. Again, so in this bag, you have a bag of probability distribution. So, of course, once you have the probability distribution that your mechanism would have picked, the act dependent probability in the sense of act dependent probability distribution, it would also, I mean, by restriction induce, I mean, act dependent probability values for each state. Okay, I guess. Okay. Can I just let me... Uh, yeah, of course, of course. I, I, I guess I'm... Okay. So, this P defines a, a probability over, over acts. Over... No, 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 no. PF as the, uh, the state space. PF... The grade, say, like, uh, The grade in this example. So, this is still a probability function defined over the state space. Okay? Now, the only thing is, now if you ask me, what is your probability or the probability of the decision maker for state 1? I cannot tell you in general, I have to tell you, well, it depends about which act is he's facing or he's contemplating taking. I cannot answer you in general. Okay? okay I think my confusion is, very ba is much more yeah. basic. So, uh, I, so in equation two, if you look in equation two, yeah. PF is a function, right? Act is in equation two, right? Yeah. And you're plugging into it a state, SI. Yeah. And that returns a value. Yeah. Okay. Now, in this PF that's down below, there, there, you can't, it doesn't make sense to plug in a state. You're summing over all states for something in some set of P's. So, I, I don't know how to read the same thing. I, I don't ha know how to... So, here it's a probability distribution that I'm taking and telling you that to know the probability distribution attached to an act, you have to look at the one that minimizes expected utility for a given utility function in a set of probability, f uh, probability distributions. So, yeah. Can I try to yeah. clarify this? So, pi, pi is a set that contains, let's say, two distributions, P1 and P2. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is, uh, given for a fixed f, you calculate the sum inside the parentheses for p1, and you calculate the sum for p2. You have a utility function too, right? And then you take you take pf to be equal to p1 or p2, depending on which of those sums is the smallest. 
the argument that minimizes. I see, right, okay. This is maybe the, the part of I the mean, thing. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not, okay, okay, I get, I get it, okay. Okay, get is, it, is it clarifying? Yeah, yeah, Hard. okay, so that's what, okay, I see. Okay, so that's the story in this particular model, but actually, uh, it's a story that would go through, it's not particular to this model. Actually, a bunch of non-expected utility models could be seen exactly like that, which means as stories telling you that how to get a probability distribution for each act. That is to say, most non-expected utility models can be seen as models that depart from expected utility only the, in that they use probability distribution that depend on the act instead of being independent of the act as in the original expected utility function I've, 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 I've shown you, okay? Actually, if you want to know what does it take to fall out of this class, well, if you violate state-wise dominance, then you will fall out of this class, that you won't be able to cook up a probability function for each act that would enable you to act dependent expected utility represent the choice data. But essentially, atop the usual package of weak order, if you have state-wise dominance, then you will always, in particular in the finite case I'm concentrating here, be able to access a uh, act-dependent expected utility representation. Okay? So that's not at all a particular uh, weird uh, property of the maximum expected utility model. It's actually a very common feature of the largest chunks of non-expected utility model that they can be seen as act-dependent expected utility models just with various stories for how you get this PF. Again, the maximum expected utility story you have the argument over this set of multipliers and then other models will have different stories. But they, they fit this, this mold. Okay? In the, in the yeah. example you're talking about, the acts are, I will get an A, I bet on getting an A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I thought that was the beginning of a question, so maybe you no, should no, get... No, I just wanted to make sure I'm, I'm following. Yeah. Because you, I don't think you ever actually said what the acts were. You said something about bets, but you didn't really... Yeah, I mean... Yeah, uh, I've, I've indeed slalom between what was, depending on what was convenient for the example. But in general, as, as soon as it defines, you know, distribution, state distributions of payoff, it can be anything. So indeed, in the first example, I tapped heavily on the fact that I was talking about actions and they had some causal effects and so on and so forth. And here I'm retrieving to a leaner notion of just betting, but just not to, um, to show, I mean, to emphasize the fact that this formalism uh, is compatible with both and you should not, this is also why I'm using payoff and not consequences for those that know about the savage uh, framework because I think it, it can be confusing. So this neutrality, uh, I hope, is, is, uh, is an asset for, for the analysis. Okay, what do I want to emphasize here is that in this observational game of decision theory, the one we're playing here structurally, identifying the beliefs and desired decision maker, looking at its choices, act-dependent probability is a much larger class than mole hazard. If you have mole hazard, then you would have a form of act-dependent probability in the choice data you observe, but you can have act-dependent probability for reasons that are actually totally unconnected with mole hazard that do, do not illustrate at all a form of rich agency that would enable this maker with influencing the realization of uncertainty. Just usual epistemic reasons, the persons within some limits processes uncertainty in a non-Bayesian way, non-expected utility way. Okay? And this is what I want you to remember for, and you put this in a pan, forget about it a little bit, we'll use it in the end. If you have act state dependence or act dependent probabilities in your choice data, this can, but need not, indicate mole hazard. This is all I'll need for the rest of the talk. Now, of course, I'm not saying that the two cannot be teased apart, the mole hazard interpretation and the non-mole hazard interpretation of act state dependence. I'm just telling you again that this very, very level of generality, you just tell me act state dependence, act dependent probability, I can't tell you if it's one or the other. Of course, there would be different markers, and it's an interesting question, it's not right to, to find the, the behavioral markers of, of, of those two things. Right, so this is the preparatory groundwork that will be very useful. Very simple distinction, uh, in fact, but consequential, as we'll see. I also have a yeah. simple question, because I've forgotten how these words are used. Yeah. In the case where there's moral hazard, yeah. there the probability of the um, state of nature is condi conditional on the act is representing a causal relation? Or can Not necessarily. It could, it could be an evidential. It could be, yeah. And in the other case... This is what I'm saying here, that this is, as far as I can understand the structure, I think just talking about act state dependence. Uh, let me put it this way. 
assume we really uh, forget about the deliberative game, you just observe act state dependence in, in, in the data, and for some reason you know it's more hazard. Now it's still another question to tease to tease off, you know, to differentiate between those two big rivals in this field. Would this be actually causal dependence or is it a weaker form, I mean call it evidential form of dependence? How do you see this in the data? What are the behavioral markers of either? I don't know. Right? It's yet another question. Did you have another question? No, so it sounds like it's this. In, in one case, it's the, um, it's, you, you know whether it's evidential or causal. In the other case, you don't. I'm not quite sure what the two, the, the big gap, the big separation is. So the simplest answer for the purpose of this talk is don't get into causal and evidential. This is a potential refinement on this track what I call the substantial understanding of act state dependence, which I connect conceptually to moral hazard. Mm -hmm. Then is it causal, is it direct, indirect dependence, is it causal, evidential, is there a common cause, a correlation? I don't know. But for me, for the purpose of this talk, classify them as substantial understanding of, of act state dependence. Maybe it's unsatisfactory for certain purposes, but for mine I don't think it, it is. But maybe we can come back to that if you're... Good. Now, let's get to the main uh, player of the talk, this, this, this story of state and utility. Now, what is this problem I alluded to in the introduction and I'm going to now tell you all you, you need to know about? Well, it's about the uniqueness claim of theorems like the expected utility one. So recall the uniqueness claim. Your utility function is pinned down up to a strictly positive transformation. The probability is absolutely unique. Okay? Now, however, observe the following very simple thing. Take any full support probability Q. So again, maybe here I should try to improve full support probability distribution, Q over the state space. And state by state, do this stupid multiply and divide operation. Okay, so state by state, you multiply and divide by the probability values attributed by this probability distribution, new one, Q to each state. But instead of seeing things as cancelling out, as they do mathematically, you see this as uncovering another expected utility decomposition of the choice data you're observing. One that instead of expected utility representing the choice data with P, the probability function you started from, and U, this state independent utility function, decomposes it differently with Q, a different probability function by assumption, and a utility function us that now depends on the states within some well-defined limits with the weights given by the ratio of the old to the new probabilities okay so what does this simple equality because those are of course by i mean trivially the same numbers this trivial equality illustrates the fact that p and u eu represents the choice data if only q and us this now state dependent utility within those very tight limits uh represent the data as well so there are two different interpretations then from the, all the choices that you start with. Yeah, I'm not sure I would like to call it interpretation. I would like, I would like, to, I would like to have a stronger claim, of course, uh, about and, and mentioning the identification aspects of it. But we'll get to this right now. It might seem like a kind of an indeterminacy. At first. That's the point. That's the point. And uh, I'm going to cash this out right now in certain terms. And the, the whole name of the game is what does it take to solve this indeterminacy? Okay, this is, this is the point of the talk. Now, precisely to see how bad it is, assume there is no null state. A null state means a state to which the original distribution in the canonical representation, uh, a state to which this probability distribution P would attribute value zero, but it's actually a behavioral notion. So assume there's none. You can encompass those in the analysis. It just makes things a bit, a bit messier. If you're interested, ask me the question time, but assume them away. So you have a full support probability distribution P here. How bad is the situation? Well, it's pretty simple, of course. Uh, it's that the, you're in a situation of total identification, in the sense you start from a, an AU representation with probability function P that has full support. Now give me any Q that's full support as well. I'll be able to find you some utility function that would be state dependent in this sense, and that together with Q would generate the, tr the same choice data. So in this sense, in the class of full support probability distribution, in the sense, the situation is really one of total identification. Okay? You start from whichever uh, full support probability function and you can instantiate in the relevant way any, uh, any other uh, full support probability distribution Q. Okay? So that's really a very bad situation, of course. 
Now, what's, what's the causes of this? Well, the right order of ideas is this one. P is not unique absolutely, but it's unique up to a particular transformation of U. U is actually not pinned down up to a strictly positive affine transformation that would be state independent, but the strictly positive affine transformation can be state dependent. What does it mean? It means give me any state dependent affine transformation of the utility function u, I'll be able to define a probability function, the full support one, that will together with this utility function generate the same choice data. Okay, this is exactly what I illustrated, I'm just going the other way around. Instead of starting from the probability and looking at the induced um, uh, state-dependent utility with the weights given by the ratio of the old to the new probability, I mean, I can go the other way around. I define some fine weights, right, and then I renormalize in the appropriate way, and I'll get the same choice data. Uh, with an expected utility uh, 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 form. So, again, the order of idea, P is unique for a particular, given not absolutely, but given a particular transform of U, the existing condition of the formula do not pin down U sufficiently, they pin down U up to a strictly positive fine transformation that can depend, that can have state dependent different weights, and this is why the existence condition of this expected utility representation do not enable one to pin down uniquely one probability function. Okay, so this is this is what's happening in those cases from whichever end you start, the utility the utility end or the probability end. Now it cannot be I think emphasized enough how bad the situation is for the prospect of having a decision theoretic semantics for beliefs. Actually although it's something that starts again um, as I described on the utility side it's not that bad for the desire side of the identification exercise. Just because maybe contingently, or maybe more for more profound reasons, but given what we do with utility numbers, typically what we do with utility numbers is look at the ordering of differences, or the ordering of ratio of differences, and so on and so forth. Now, those sorts of variations, state depends utility within these limits, they do not change anything to this information that we think is important for identifying utility functions. So if you want to do I don't know, calculate your arrow Pratt indices state by state, it'll be the same with those variations. It doesn't change anything. So for the desired side, it's not as bad as it looks, because in fact, although there are some variations, it's not the same utility function that would be taken the expectation of. In some sense, for what we look at in utility function, it, it doesn't change much. Surprisingly, perhaps, but it doesn't change much. On the probability side, however, or the belief side, let's call it this way more generally, is of course very bad. We cannot even, under the assumptions I, I mentioned earlier, we cannot even claim a form of partial identification, right? There is a total form of identification within the class of full support probability function uh, distributions, uh, which I'm looking at um, by assumption here. Okay? So this is the problem of state dependent utility. Lots of people have worked on this. Uh, I'm not going to go through this slide. Uh, those are the most important references since the early savage days. And this is a nice quotation by Carney, who's the best specialist of this, but let's not spend time on this. We can come back to this later if you're interested. Now, I think the two important questions, and the one I'll be addressing in the end of the talk, is, are those ones. How general is this problem, and what does it take? How can we solve this problem? It's two important questions, in particular, to assess the final fate of this decision-theoretic semantics for beliefs. <coughs> now, how general is the problem? Don't look in the interest of, of time, don't look at the first uh, bullet point, the, import, the important one is, is the second. I mean how much, so how general? I mean how much does it extend out in more general conditions than the conditions under which the original expected utility representation exists? This is what I mean. Now, presumably it's more general in various ways, but what I want to focus on specifically is how much does it extend to non-expected utility in the strong sense of having different models for beliefs? So having a family of probabilities, for instance, having a showcase integral or whatever you would, you'd like, there would be a different modelization of beliefs in the various models of decision-making and uncertainty, the non-expected utility side, right? So this is what I mean. How general is the problem? I want to know how much it generalizes to different models of beliefs in non-expected utility theory. This is, this is the key point, okay? Now, the other question, how can one solve the problem? Here again, uh, maybe don't look at the first point, it's another discussion, just by assumption, assume I want to solve it just with choice data. So I want to solve the problem, solving the problem meaning identifying one belief just with choice data on principle grounds, telling you this is the belief of the decision maker, 
just with choice data. And I want to know if at what cost this can be done. By okay? semantics of belief, yeah. you mean uh, what are the conditions of the choice data uh, that um, attribute this belief with, with this probability function to the... Yeah, I think, I think we're talking about the same thing, yeah. I mean, I, I take it, to put it differently, maybe that's helpful, that if you have a semantics for a belief that does not pin down uniquely one probability function and the assumption, of course, that the guy is a, is a Bayesian guy with only one probability function, that's not a successful semantic. I mean, you need, you need to add something to. It's a kind of uh, success condition on your, on your semantics that you would be able to pin on only one down. Okay. Now, some people disagree with this, and in particular, in uh, so in philosophy, I'm not very aware that many would, but maybe you're an example of this. In economics, people would be very happy and saying, oh, I mean, you know, we just need additively separable representation, whether you decompose a product like this well, or like that. There's not a unique one when skeptical about it, like Quine was. Yeah, I mean, okay, there's various ways to living with the problem without solving it. There's one way of saying, it shows there's a form of indetermination and maybe that's a philosophical message. There are people are saying we don't, you know, there's maybe no message, but at least for some purposes, uh, it's enough. So a guy I'll quote later on, uh, Bob Now, has a very intriguing uh, paper that uh, if you have time you should read, it's called Definite is Right, Probabilities Don't Exist. Essentially taking the stance that, not, a f not on philosophical grounds, but on economics grounds, saying, you know, what we do in economics, we do comparative statics, we do, you know, how your utility function conditional on one state compares to one condition on another state. Do we really need beliefs? No, we don't need beliefs. We don't need beliefs anyhow. We just need to have a reliable representation, a general additively separable representation, for instance, in this case, and then work on it. But beliefs is maybe a piece of metaphysics, maybe this is some, some way a, a philosopher would, 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 would expand on, on, on his claim. So there's various ways of living with, with the issues with various levels of philosophical uh, involvement. Um, but anyhow, yeah, in the, in the context of this talk, when I say I take it, although this is debatable, of course, but I take it that if it's, it's, it's a necessary condition on the successful good you know, decision theoretic semantics for beliefs to the effect that you would believe E is more probable than E prime if only if you would bet on E rather than E prime or something like that, more general versions depending on the form your beliefs take, that it would pin down, you have a I mean, satisfactory level of uniqueness in the procedure you propose. Okay? You're taking the contents of the belief, of course, for granted here. That's not sure, I guess, I mean, I don't know exactly what you mean by that, but sure, I mean, yeah, there's all sorts of big, big assumptions that I'm making here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so let's now get to what I wanted to lead you to. Um, and those are the two main answers to those two questions I just mentioned prevailing currently in literature that I'm going to uh, show you must be rejected. So the two answers to the two questions I just gave, remember the two questions. One, how general is the problem in terms of expected utility, non-expected utility? I, expect, I explained to you the problem in the context of expected utility. Could I have started with a more general context or not? Okay, that was the question. And the second is, what does it take to solve the problem on, you know, following a kind of conservative methodology for the standard of decision theory, namely choice data, just choice data, having no non-choice data input. You don't ask people for their desires or their beliefs, you just try to infer them from choices. Now, the two views that are prevailing in literature are the following view. One I'm going to call the general problem view, and the other one the radical solution view. The general problem view is the view according to which the problem is the same for expected and non-expected utility alike. This is the same. This is the same meaning. Those two branches of decision theory and uncertainty are exposed to the problem to the same degree. Exposed to the problem meaning are exposed to the misidentification or identification issues caused by statement utility um, all the same. Okay? And the radical solution view is the view according to which to solve the problem, that is to say to achieve an appropriate level of identification only with choice data, you need to involve, it is necessary to involve more hazard, more hazard in the sense I previously uh, uh, alluded to, namely you need to assume that the decision maker has one way or another the capacity to influence the likelihood of the events on which he is betting, if you want to talk about it this way. Okay? So I'm going to unpack the second view that of course is, looks a bit strange at first, and this is part of the reasons for which I called it the radical view, because it was not supposed to be part of the rules of the game when you uh, 
try to identify the beliefs and the desires of the decision maker looking at his choices, there's a natural assumption that the choice data would be somehow a kind of in neutral instrument to revealing the beliefs and the desires. And the fact that they could somehow change the variables of interest is something that sounds a bit uh, unfair, not the rules of the game. So this is what I mean to convey superficially at first, and we'll get more into this by saying it's a radical solution view. So it has, it has something very satisfactory about it. Now, I'm not going to spend time on this, just, I mean, trust me, this is really the two views in literature, and there's no denying it. This is the paper I mentioned by now before, that expresses the first view very well, another paper by Drez that expresses the second view very well. And I take my modest part of blame for the first view, which I endorsed without checking carefully enough uh, in earlier work. Now, what I'm going to do now is very simple. I'm going to explain to you where this radical solution view comes from. What is the, this funny link between moral hazard and aesthetic and utility? It sounds conceptually very bizarre at first. And once we figure this out, it will follow almost immediately, actually, as we'll see, using the tools from the first part of the talk, that we must reject those two views that are presently dominant in literature, namely reject this radical solution view and reject the general problem view. There are two sides of the same coin, as we'll see. But the main, main action will be the first thing, understanding what the connection is, and then it will follow very quickly, in fact, that uh, those views are, are, are way too strong. Okay, so what is the relation between state-dependent utility and, and moral hazard? Why is there any link between the two? Now, I'm going to explain to you why involving moral hazard does seem sufficient to solve the issue. I won't be too picky about the sufficiency side, there's more to say, especially, especially from a, a conceptual, philosophical point of view. I'm just going to show you why the math goes through, which is enough for the purpose of this talk, because what I want to discuss is the necessity side. Namely that it is necessary to involve more hazard to solve the identification problem we've mentioned before. So I won't be too picky about sufficiency, but this is the important thing to understand. And when we'll understand why it's sufficient, then the rest will follow uh, pretty easily, as we'll see. Now, the simplest case of moral hazard will look like the formula we've seen before, formula 2. Namely, you'll see in the data a form of act-dependent probability. That is to say the guy will have one utility function, and he will have a collection of act-dependent probability distributions, a big set called P. And for the sake of, of argument, um, uh, continue assuming they all have uh, full support. Okay? And what you see in the data is that he follows the rules of maximizing act-dependent expected utility. Okay? Now, now let's try to play the same multiply and divide trick we've seen earlier about say dependent utility. Now it still goes through, mathematically speaking. Pick any act f and instead of the old uh, full support probability that was attached to it pf, now take qf, whatever, and then multiply and divide, it will also generate, it, generate an expected utility form with a different decomposition of the act-dependent probability and the state-dependent utility. Okay? However, there is something that did not happen before. Then we, of course, now you have to do it for every act-dependent probability distribution. And there's no reason to assume that in general, the state-dependent utility function that would be thus defined with the weights of the old probability and the new probability would cohere across act, right? For instance, if you take the trivial case, you just divide all the probabilities in your old probability distributions, <laughs> trying to stick to it, sorry, in your old set P by the same new probability distribution, okay? Of course, you will get by assumption different state-dependent utility weights, state by state, right? So what does it mean that if you pick just any f and g, and any pf and pg, and qf and qg, of course those two numbers will be different in general. The state-dependent utility weights will differ across acts. So it's trivial in the case that suffices to establish an important claim, as we'll see, where you pick just one new probability distribution, but you can find also non-trivial claim here, non-trivial illustration here. I picked, although I'm afraid it might be too small for some member in the audience, a case very simple, you have three states and you have three act-dependent probabilities, let's assume they are observed in the data, only those three are used in conjunction to any act. And then I come up with you know, a different set of act-dependent probabilities, now I call it Q, and if I just you know, take any old set Q, of course, in general, I will get different state-dependent utility weights. Each 
multiply and divide operation will generate a different state dependent utility function. It will differ across that. Okay? And the numbers are here just to illustrate that there, there's nothing mysterious about the, the statement number seven here. So what does it mean? Well, it means that if you are concerned, as I think we sh should be as a first step in any case, only with state dependent utility as we have been understanding up to now, that is to say, utility that can be state dependent but with act independent weights, then there's a form of uh, upgrade in the identification uh, we can achieve in this setting. Because it means that if you start from a representation, act dependent expected utility representation, with the set of act dependent probability distribution being P, you will always be able to find another set of act dependent probability, call it probability distributions, call it Q, that will be incompatible with the choice data, incompatible meaning that you will not be able to generate the same choice data with this new um, 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 set of act dependent probabilities Q and some state dependent utility function. As we understood it up to now, that is to say a utility function that is state dependent but with act independent weights. Okay? That's something that you cannot claim in the case of expected utility. Right? In expected utility, as I, I mean, this is one aspect of the total identification situation. You cannot find any expected utility representation of which you could claim that you could find some full support probability Q that you will not be able to instantiate to generate the same choice data. Okay? This is just another way of spinning the fact that within the full support probability distribution domain, this, this, this is a situation of total identification. Okay? So that's already a major progress. There is a form of partial identification that is achieved. Okay? There are some sets of beliefs that you can exclude for sure in this sense. Okay? But there's more. You can show that in some cases you can achieve a level of full identification. That is that you can find some conditions under which the set P that would be featured in your act dependent expected utility representation would be the only set of act dependent probabilities that could generate the data together with a utility function that could be state dependent or not. That's the only one. And the key in observing this fact is, is the following proposition that gives you a sufficient condition for being sure that no, not just that not any old set Q, but no new set Q could fit the bill. Namely, is the following one is sort of richness condition that if your set P of act dependent probabilities contains as many linearly independent probability vectors as there are states in the state space, then you can show for a fact, not just assume or hypothesize, but you can show that there is no state dependent alternative representation of the choice data you started from. That is to say, you won't be able to find another set of act dependent probabilities Q that together with the state dependent utility function as we understood it, that is to say, with act independent weights, can generate the same, the same choice data. So, the probability distributions I mentioned earlier, they do not satisfy this, this uh, richness condition. It's easy to see if you, you just do the math. And indeed, in this case, if you take this other probability distribution, this other set Q than the one I mentioned earlier, you can find an alternative state-dependent utility rep representation. You can, if you just look at what the, the state-dependent utility function they induce, uh, they will be the same across ACT. So this means that if I have an ACT-dependent utility representation with a set P here, then there exists uh, uh, another uh, representation with a different set of beliefs that would fit the data, and you're still in a situation non-full uh, identification. Okay? Partial, as we said earlier, but not, not full identification. Whereas, for instance, in this case of this other set of ACT-dependent probabilities, they satisfy the richness condition up there. And in this case, if this is what you observe in the data, again, in the simple, very simple sense, you have just three states and only three act-dependent probabilities actually played. <laughs> if this is what you observe, then you can assert from the choice data and the choice data only, not from any sort of other assumptions, that this is the only uh, uh, set of act-dependent probabilities that, that are underpinning um, the, the choice you observed. Okay? So this is the key uh, mathematical fact in understanding why mall hazard is, or seems, again I'm not being too picky here, sufficient
to solve the problem, that is to say, to pin down one, one set of one belief, whatever the form the beliefs take, despite the possibility that there would be this form of state-dependent utility variations in this very limited realm, right, in, in, in within a fine, a fine limit. But at this stage it becomes almost mechanical. How much did we use the fact that the act-dependent probabilities should be interpreted as moral hazard? We did not use it at all. The same, exactly the same story would go through for any model that has some act-dependent probabilities and only one set of act-dependent probabilities, however it got them. For instance, I could have gone exactly through the same story from A to Z with the maximum expectativity models and the act-dependent probability distributions it's associated to. And it's not just this model. I could have this story for any model that's tied to, that's tying whatever form the beliefs take in the model to one and only one set of act-dependent probabilities. As long as I have that, then I can check that the set satisfy or does not satisfy, for instance, the richness condition. And in some cases, I'll be able to say that this is the only uh, beliefs that fit the data. And although there is a possibility that utility would be state-dependent in general, within the limits I mentioned before, in this case, we can exclude it for sure. We can assert that this is the only beliefs that, that, that fit the data. So what does it mean? Well, it means that, again, as, as I announced earlier on, we need to reject those two views I mentioned earlier, that are really two sides of the same coin. It is not true that moral hazard is necessary to solve the problem of steady dependent utility. It is sufficient at best. Witness any non-expected utility model that's actually a act-dependent expected utility model. All the previous considerations that are the key in the progress in identification would apply to the same degree. We need also to reject the general problem view. It is not true that non-expected utility is equally exposed to expected utility. It is in general less exposed and sometimes not exposed at all. In all cases, you'll be able to say that there's a form of partial identification that has no counterpart in the case of expected utility. You'll be able to exclude some set of on the assumptions that I made earlier, full support collection of act-dependent probabilities and by saying you're sure that those ones cannot fit the data and it has no equivalent, uh, there's no equivalent statement in the case of expected utility. And in some cases, in some cases, you'll be able to claim on principle grounds that you achieved full identification. Okay? So, this completes rejecting the two views that are pre currently dominant in, in the literature, but there's something more before concluding I, I need to do, which is we cannot stop there. We have also to think more carefully about what does it mean about this problem of standard utility and the kind of philosophical significance that we have, some people have, have, have given to it. Now, I think there's two sides of the, what we should, how we should revise our views about these problems. I think there's some reassuring news from a mythological point of view and some more embarrassing or difficult to process news. So the order one good news is that there are some possibility results for a what I've called a decision theoretic semantics for beliefs. There are some cases where when people tell you 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 believe that E is more likely than E prime if only if you bet on E rather than E prime, there's some unpacking of betting and believing that will make this absolutely true. There is no, there with, with choice data only, right? So that's very good news. And, um, and again, this is the most important news in some respects. There are some possibility results that are unquestionable, even taking very seriously, as we've done here, the problem of state dependent utility. I think order two good news also is that we don't need to go more hazard to solve this problem, which I mean, sounded very natural at first. I mean, it sound, I mean here I, I, I put up a quotation by Drez in his early work that pioneered this approach that I think brings up very, very vividly the point to which this almost tasted like a paradox. Drez writes, these theorems tell us that the subjective probability of an event can be defined precisely only when that probability is chosen by the decision maker. Well, I mean, this is true, this is true, but I mean, this was really a very a very paradoxical, in many ways, uh, conclusion, if it was a conclusion. And the good news is that you don't need to do that. You can preserve this somewhat implicit rules of the game that when you're observing the choice data with the hope of identifying the underlying beliefs and desires, 
it's under the contention that those choice data are somehow neutral instruments to revealing those, those mental attitudes, let's call them this way. Right? So it's not that the game doesn't work at all if you change this, as we've seen through the sort of formalism I've been playing with before, it still works, but still, it was an unfair change of the rules of the game in, in some respects. So that's the good news, there's some good news for the for decision theoretic semantics of, 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 of beliefs in particular, and we don't need to revise the methodology too much. Nevertheless, I mean, there's also some more difficult news to process. Now, it means that this problem of stereotypic utility is much more model-specific than people have said hitherto. It means that it's not a problem that you should rigorously describe at the, very, at the general level of folk psychology where you have beliefs and desires and choices. It all depends. It all depends on how your beliefs are cashed out and how they combine with your desires to uh, produce a, a, an action. Now, in a sense, that's not very surprising from a sort of logical, or if, if I may use this term, statistical point of view, that the non-expectability model would achieve better identification results. They identify, in some sense, they identify less. They're more general models, typically, and they achieve weaker form of identification. So if you have weaker form of identification, you also have less risks of, uh, of misidentification in, in some general sense. So that's not surprising from, if you, with retrospect, it should not have been something we should have thought that much about. But again, it means now we know that to describe and think about this problem, we cannot describe it at this general level of choice, revealing beliefs or desires. It all depends on the models really you're using. It will play an important role in the gravity of the model. And it also means now we know that we're stuck with various data for the philosophical analysis. There's some possibility results that we can discuss the extent and importance of to the effect that given some chase data, in some cases you'll be able that to say that although you take due account of state dependent utility, this set of beliefs is the only one that fits the data, but you also have, I mean, you're still stuck with this sort of impossibility results that you had before. Within expected utility, I mean, there's nothing more you can do, right? If you just have the, um, for instance, a set of, of choice data satisfying the savage axioms, you're stuck with a form of total identification within the assumptions I made earlier, there's, I mean, there, this is still a fact. So, for appreciating what decision theory here tells us from a philosophical point of view, we'll need to, of course, balance a bit those two things. The more reassuring news that, they, that in some cases the identification were promised is possible indeed. And the same old cases, although they're more restricted than we thought before, but still they're here, uh, in which no identification can be achieved and it's still something we're, we're stuck with. Good, so let me just briefly conclude. I think the contributions, uh, the main contributions are the following three contributions. The first one is this very simple but consequential distinction between non-moral hazard and moral hazard interpretation of axiom dependence. And I think, I hope, but I think too, that <laughs> It can be useful in, in several sorts of, of, of discussions. Um, I think it's, it's also interesting uh, for the people working in causal decision theory and the like to realize that from an observational point of view, there's, there's this layer of act-state dependence can be unpacked in, in various ways and the, you could observe act-state dependence for topics that have nothing to do with their main interests. It's you know, something that's worth thinking about. But in any case, when you apply this in the particular case of the problem of state dependent utility, it brings out those, those facts, this news, although, as I emphasized just before, it, it still needs to be philosophically processed, and I don't exactly know what the final appreciation should be, but in case you can claim easily the following things, namely, first, non-expected utility is less exposed than expected utility to the problem of state dependent utility. They're not equally exposed, but they're less exposed. And second, there are some choice-based solutions to this problem, uh, that do not involve uh, moral hazard. And those are the, uh, I think, two uh, most important uh, facts we need to take into account now. Thanks.
Yep. Okay, uh, here should be pretty careful. What I mean to say is just that the non-expected utility model typically would be logical generalizations of expected utility. You agree with this bit? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you have a model that instead of saying you have one probability function, you have a set thereof, you have less margin for misidentification. It was not supposed to be a very learned remark. Uh, it was supposed to be a common sense. Uh, less margin for misidentification. Well, in the sense illustrated here, namely that you could find another set of probability distribution that within some rules of the game could generate the same choice data. As we've seen in passing from, say, the multi-prior models that I get and Schmeidler and the original savage thing, when you go from one probability function to a set thereof, you have some progress in identification that you can you can observe, right? Some progress in no, I'm not following. Okay, so where should I restart from? So a set of probabilities is a more complicated object. It is. So you have less complicated, less, more complicated objects that could fit the bill. That's this, the sort of simple intuition. So the, the probability distribution entails that it's the set of probability. If the set of probability distributions is more general, it's a bigger set. So if you have this probability, that's your point, right? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the, I mean, on, on, you know, on the on the on the one hand, you have this you know needle in in, in the, the the hay, and the other the other one, the other case, you take the whole hay thing. Yeah. So I mean, there's a natural sense. Although I mean, I'm trying to be. Maybe I should have been more careful. I, I'm pretty sure there would be some cases in which this intuition would would not be correct from a statistical point of view. But at least from the point of view of the decision models, I think there's a. I don't mean how to think about it. I mean, yeah. uh, the hay stack. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, if you gave the kind of uh, geophysical coordinates of the needle, it would be a lot more, a lot easier than giving the geophysical coordinates of all these straws in the haze. Yeah, but it's not all the straws we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about the haystack. But you could, so, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to get my head around it. Yeah. Um, is it the same haystack if there's a hole in it? Uh, n no, in general, it would not be the same haystack, no. So it's a very complicated object, right? It, it, it is a complicated... Identifying it in a full sense is more complicated than identifying the needle. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I need to disagree with this, but I see better why you, you, you didn't like this, this comment then. Well, I'm trying to understand yeah. what, what you mean by it. Uh, well, but what I mean by it is... is I'm not saying I don't agree, I just don't, obviously I don't understand the sense in which you mean it. Yeah, well, I mean, I think is the sense we just mentioned, there, there is this sense in which in the case of expected utility, you're just, I mean, claiming to have found this needle in the haystack. Whereas in those, in some non-expected utility, you just say this stack fits the bill. But and so it's... So it's in other words, you're, you're giving a, uh, what you're identifying yeah. is... I mean, this makes sense if you're admitting just a small group of possible sets of probability distributions that can be described in some simple way. That's your haystack. You're not really describing the details of the haystack. Yeah, but I mean, you're you're tied to this choice you're data. I mean, saying maybe how tall and wide it is. Yeah, I mean, maybe here we're running into the limits of the analogy that I maybe uh, not not very wisely introduced. But there's something, of course. I mean, well, you're you limit. You, you, you could say it's any set of probability distributions that gives this. With uh, a particular state, probably less than a half. That, that's a simple description of a. Yeah. Uh, so there's some sets of probability distributions you can describe very easily, and others you can. Of course, yeah, yeah. So you're somehow uh, saying we're going to use the ones you can describe very easily in some particular. Yeah, yeah. So t for instance, in 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 the case, I mean, I did not emphasize. This.